Okay, good afternoon, everyone. When I listen this morning to the talks and speech, I feel like everyone has a real job, and I question if I really have a real one. But uh, so I wanted to, to, to introduce to you what I'm doing and give you a perspective of how we can, of landscaping in a changing planet. My objective is to convince you that our planet has changed so much that maybe our landscaping, sh it should um, follow these changes. So I wanted to start to introduce the two places I work with. So the first place is the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. It's one of the 10 NASA center. It's the smallest one, but by itself it does half of the NASA mission. And it's the lab in charge of ro robotic missions on planets. <coughs> and also it's the only NASA center who's managed by a university, which is California Institute of Technology. It is established 25 years before NASA and it joined NASA in 1959 and it was established by a German scientist, Dr. Van Braun. I also, I teach in a university called the University of Southern California. Uh, so the, in the School of uh, Engineering in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And for those of you who do not know the University of Southern California, when Neil uh, Armstrong, when he walked on the moon, he was a master student at the University of Southern California, which make Neil Armstrong the most famous master student on the planet, not just a US astronaut. So our School of Engineering, it prides itself to be the craziest place on Earth. It just does everything that is crazy, including to hire people like me. And uh, everything we do is just on the edges of logic. <coughs> so my job is to, to understand planetary evolution, so climate change on planets, and water evolution on planets, and why we do that. Many people are skeptical to climate change on Earth. I mean, they think it's a hook. Come on, guys, you are exaggerating. Oh, the Earth temperature raised in the past couple of degrees. So all of this thing is resonating on and on. But if you look to the climate change on Earth and you compare it to Mars, compare it to Venus, compare it to icy moons of Jupiter, you will understand that what's happening right now is not usual. What's happening right now is very alarming, and we are evolving very, in a very different way than the sister planet of our own planets. I also study climate change and environmental change in arid areas, in the deserts. And that's, by the way, was my original PhD. So when I started my PhD, I, it was the most boring topic any, anyone could have. It's, finding water in the desert. I mean, who cares, really? I mean, finding water in the desert. And it's the perfect PhD topic when you're born in Libya, when you are from my parents in Egypt, when you are from a poor nation. I left Egypt, went to France to study water in my desert area where nobody cares. So <clears throat> when I reached half of my PhD, I still remember that year 2000, I was lucky enough, somebody asked me, my PhD advisor, uh, he's now a member of the Academy of, of Sciences, uh, Pierre Ongrenaz. He told me, Sam, you want to be poor or you want to be rich? I say, I want to be rich. I am already poor, so I can only be rich. And so he said, listen, everything you do on finding water in the desert, we can do it for finding water on Mars. And that will make the world more interesting. So we developed all these techniques to find water on the deserts to look for water on Mars, including well, this radar, so this technique to, low be, to, to look few meters below the ground in the Sahara here, you see that there is n nothing, but if you look few meters deep underground, you find this big r r river network, which indicate that the Sahara 20,000 years was wet and has a very similar landscape like the one you see uh, today here in Europe. And so why again somebody who looked to water on Mars can help look for water on Earth? If you look to the 
publication in the last 20 years about the groundwater by numbers, so 615 in Egypt, 535 Saudi Arabia. The biggest place where we have publication on groundwater is Mars. And why? <coughs> and there are 60 institutes working on water on Mars compared to less than that in the earth environment. And this is why, <coughs> because looking for water on Mars is a science and technology uh, endeavor. Everybody want to hear about. But looking for water in the Sahara is a charity thing. Nobody cares about charity. And when you ask yourself if you donated a euro to someone in the street and find him next day working with you anywhere, that didn't happen. That's why charity is not the solution to water and environmental issues in the Middle East. So now let's talk about how far our planet is changing and why Mars tells us a lot about it. So Mars is the half of the Earth. It's a desert environment. We are a blue environment, a very a changing environment. But, but Mars is our sister planet. So the changes, the climatic changes that happened here on Mars tell us how we're going to be ending. So this is, is our end. Earth one day is going to turn like Mars in billions of years. So if we can understand that end uh, uh, point, we can understand everything in between. So this is just to show you that Mars is about half the size of, of the Earth. This would be just a projection uh, uh, of, of the US map. Now the landscape of Mars is really this red. And this is, is the real image, the calibration of the image. So you can see this red is not fake, it's not a filter. This is really uh, the landscape, how it looked like Mars. And you have that same, the same, the Hustle storm we have on Earth. And also you have some, some flows on Mars, recent flows, very similar to the ones you see in the Sahara. And so this basically the big question was Mars was a blue planet like ours. And then this question that Elon Musk keep raising all the time, we're gonna go to Mars to colonize Mars and make Mars and re-landscape Mars to be a blue planet. All of these are questions we're trying to address and it will tell us how much we can geoengineer our planet, how much we can landscape our own planet. So I work on these missions. We'll not go in detail. They aim to look to, to water on Mars. And we will work also on, on other missions that understand water and comets and asteroids and icy moon of Jupiter. Now let's go back to Earth. We tend to think that landscape has no impact, big impact on our planet. Now let's see that. Let me show you this nice example in Tunisia. This is, is a city of Tunisia, it's called Hamamat. It's a resort where people go there to spend their vacation. And this is the shoreline evolution since 1887 to 2018. And you can see that the sea is going inland, inland, inland each year. It went about 500 meter in 140 years. And if you look to these images, this is an aerial image in the, in the 1960, you see this beach, which is here, it completely disappeared here. But why it disappeared? Look to the green areas who were, who were here, who disappeared to this concrete jungle of resorts and hotels. If you look in 2014, look to where the seawater is, and in 2018, the seawater advanced to this wall, and it's starting to destroy this wall. So the seas are advancing largely in this area, not because of the sea level rise. It's because of this huge uh, 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 urbanization. And what it does is that this Concrete, you see here, when it's stopping the flood of sediment to, to, to the coastline. And that's why we have erosion that is not compensated by the sediment flow because of these urban infrastructures, which is mostly resorts. This is not only happening in, uh, in Tunisia. 
It's happening also in Los Angeles. We have the coastal area of Los Angeles is heavily urbanized and it is triggering coastal erosion in many areas that you have to replenish the beaches here with the sands from Australia. And actually, the, this is a nice article I had in Los Angeles Times, which really it shows that the cost of replenishing these beaches in Los Angeles will be six times higher than it is today. So leaving on the coastline in California and in many places around the world will be much more expensive than it is today due to coastal erosion, which is a triggered phenomena by the massive landscaping that's happening uh, inland here. With all the plantations, you see here the gardening, which is not a native of the environment. It is taking water and it is absorbing, it is uh, prohibiting the soil to move to the coastline tr and triggering erosion. So this phenomena is happening everywhere in arid areas, in the coasts here, in the Gulf, in the eastern Mediterranean bases, in Australia, and it's really a global phen phenomena that we have coastal erosion due to uh, uh, urban areas who are being developed on the coastline with no understanding of the coastal erosion happening in these areas. I want to show you one nice example of how the, the coastline and the landscaping can fool our understanding of the environment. If you look to this cune, to, to this environment, it's a green, very cute, with these uh, uh, alpine houses, the greens here, the greenery, waterfalls, the green walks, and this, you might think that this is in a very green places. In fact, this is here in Doha, in the desert. And so, what is troubling here in this picture, which these pictures do not show anybody in this garden. And by the way, so people did not intentionally went and take pictures and there is nobody. But really nobody goes because nobody feels attached to this landscape. So let me ask you, if I came here in Munich and put a landscape of palm trees, cactus, and put it in the English garden, how many people will go to see that? Well, for the local people, this is also, it feels a little bit the same. And this part uh, of the world, actually, is one that's going, it's a massive landscaping and waterscaping. This is the city of Doha in uh, 1984. And this is, uh, how many years after? And this is 40 years after. It has completely changed. But what this dangerous change is here, that this fake or artificial landscape, it's keeping, it's fooling the people to see the, cha the real change in the climate and in their en environment. So for instance, when you lack water, you still see the green hills here, which are all artificial, and you don't have the feeling that they're changing in color, so you don't have the feeling that there is a lack of water. So then the big question, this green area is beautiful and fantastic. <coughs> Are they sustainable? Is it sustainable? Let me show you one example that will address you that. This beautiful island in the Gulf near Doha, in 2015, had this very nice resort, this green area is super beautiful. In 2016, it disappeared entirely. So how there is not even a single trace that this was this. And check it on Google Earth. And the main reason why it disappeared entirely, because of a hurricane. Because these things, this vegetation is not native, because this vegetation cannot sustain natural disasters, in the first hurricane, it disappeared entirely. And the houses were torn off everything. And you can see the impact of the hurricane on the shape of the island. Look to this part of the island, how it was, and after the hurricane, how it was. Okay, and the sediments here. So that's 
is this, the same thing in Saudi Arabia, the mountains of, uh, in Saudi Arabia near the Mecca area. Uh, two years ago, they have, have received a lot of rain and it become very green for about a month or two and then it disappeared. So the truth is, you can make a desert area a green area if it was a green area before. But whatever landscaping we can do cannot sustain extreme events. We have to rethink about it. And this is one nice example, very recent example in Libya, in the city of Derna. You heard about it in the news, the flood that took the life of 10,000 people in just a day. So the Turner city here, and the flood happened here, and the watershed that led to this flood is all of this, and the two dams that collapsed, one is here and one is here. But let's make a zoom in this area, and you see this nice ranch here, which has vegetation, it's very beautiful. It's not landscaping, but it can be associated to making agriculture in the desert. Well, when the flood happened, look, it disappeared entirely. The ranch was completely taken off by the flood, not in the area where the dam has collapsed, just by extreme rain events. And you will be surprised that the deadliest flood happened in desert area. They don't happen in Europe. The deadliest flood, like the Derna one, happened in desert area. In Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, in Oman, in Libya, in, in Tunisia. So this is an example that whatever we build, we have to make sure that it can sustain extreme events that are increasing because our climate is changing. And what does mean by climate change? So I just want to tell you this notion that we think that climate change is one degree more. No. I will give you the nice, I mean, uh, uh, analogy. Climate change is not that the average will be one degree more. It's like your body, your temperature is 37 and a half. If you become 39, you sit in the bed, you're tired, you're ill, you have a headache, and it's just one and a half degree. Earth is the same, it's a system. Once you raise the average temperature of the system by 1.5 degree, the system become unpredictable. And these, Unpredictable events like the one happening in Europe, the one that happened in Libya, in Turkey, in Morocco, you name it, is part of the big changes that will be more. So when we design the landscape for the future, it, doesn't, it also needs to be resilient to these extreme events that they will come. It's not about if they will come, they will come. It's when. And so, in the paper we had in, uh, in, uh, two years ago, we warned that all these coastal areas, the sandy, uh, uh, the sandy area in from Tunisia to the, to the Nile Delta here will be very prone to natural disasters and to coastal erosion that will make, that, that actually the migration in these areas increased by 250% from these coastal areas. So in 2000, the outflow migration was 2.7 million. In 2016, it was 9.4. And so, because people think that these natural disasters will never happen, when the Derna event happened, this paper was downloaded in a week 60,000 times. Yet we could have avoided this if people looked to science but we always tend to think that we control our planet. We can geoengineer our planet. 